and WSP. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Gary Peterson. Um, we're bringing him back to the tribe. He left and he's back and he's going to give us uh, a presentation on best management practices. So a bit about Gary, some of you newcomers that may not know Gary, he, uh, he attended his first um, SWAI conference back in around year 1988 or 89 and he was a member of SWAI for 22 years. Um, he was the San Carlos Airport Manager for, um, for 22 years. And then after San Carlos, he moved on to Salinas Airport where he finished out his career at Salinas, eventually promoting up to the Public Works Director. He's a past board member, past conference chair, uh, past executive of the year, I think. Is that what it was? Executive, the executive year. He's pretty much done everything. And if you haven't had the opportunity or pleasure to hear Gary Peterson speak, you're about to, and you're going to leave wanting some more. So with that, I induce, introduce Mr. Gary Peterson. Let's see. i got to figure out if I'm going to move around or not. Um, is this one on? This one on? You hear this all right? Up a little? Got this? Got it? Good, good. I tend to move around quite a bit. I been good at standing still or sitting still or in fact even with all the meetings I go to and all the work I do the most difficult challenge for me has always been sitting still and behaving <laughs> and it will always be that way I believe so I am happy to be here I'm really happy to be here the 60th anniversary um, I look out in this room I see many new faces and uh, it's great to see all the students and uh, I want to thank Mary Ann because, you know, the people I really like in this world, you always know where you stand with them. And I promise you with Mary Ann, you will always know where you stand with Mary Ann. And she's a, a great advocate for this area and does a lot of really important good work. So thanks, Mary Ann. Um, you know, I, a lot of who I am, a lot of what I've become over the time and over this course of the career and 30 years in, in airports and 40 years total in local government uh, came from what I learned here. Um, I think one of the great things about this organization that's so important is how we learn from each other. And as we've gone up and down with the attendance at winter conferences, it's really great to see new records being made uh, and new records set and here again to learn from each other. And a lot of what I talk about and a lot of what I will always talk about is working together. How we do that. I think we're challenged. I, you know, I, I have moved on from this tribe. This is one of my tribes that I hold very dearly, and I have gone off into the world uh, to practice new skills, to learn new skills, to try out new things, uh, to get beat up, pushed around, and learn, because it's all about learning, and that's what we do here. Um, let's see here. Okay. So, um, yeah. A lot of how it works here is mentoring. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one of the, the great examples of mentoring. This is also one of the great mythologies of our current life when you realize that that last movie was a sequel to something that happened 50 years ago. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that the last movie wrapped it all up, um, but I liked it. Uh, so it has been an ongoing part of our saga, but this is also a story uh, that is in, in born into us. It's in our DNA about our histories, our growth, our development, and the journey, uh, and how we move forward, and how we become who we are, and how we, we give the best of ourselves uh, to the world in which we exist. And I've always loved Swahi for exemplifying that. But I got a challenge for you today. I got a big challenge for you. I got several big challenges for you today because one thing I know about this group and I sort of proved it um, is that we are deeply skilled people across really broad ranges of disciplines. Uh, as Mr. Crowder referenced earlier, is one of the more complex things that we do as manage an airport. I've got some things that are more complex, I promise you. But this is what we do. And as I look at you and I look at my path and my journey forward, my challenge to you is, are you doing enough? You know, you're either part of a large airport where you have a really refined skill and you help make a big organization work smoothly, moving hundreds of thousands of people and planes, or you're a GA person that does all those things by yourself and you have experience in 10, 12 different disciplines. But is that cross-discipline action, those, those learnings that we have that makes me ask you, are we doing enough for the world that we now live in? 
And I did want to say that you know what Padawan is, right? Padawan, anybody Padawan? Is an apprentice to a Jedi Knight. So uh, when I moved up out of public works, I hired a Padawan. And so, you know, where Brett may not, Brett may not look like Luke Skywalker, uh, sadly, I fear I'm looking more like Yoda every day. <laughs> so it, it's, it's part of the process. But I did want to thank Brent for, for doing this and for being such a great airport manager. One of the things, you want a best practice at airport manager, always hire someone better than you, smarter than you, and get out of the way and let them do their job. And if you get that right, you'll be fine. And I did that. He is smarter than me. He knows a lot more than me. But he is not nearly as clever or cunning as me. And that's the thing that comes with age and experience and living through all this stuff. So really, this is about the hero's journey. And if you go back to Skywalker, uh, George Lucas wrote that story based on Joseph Campbell's work on mythology. And this is what's called the monomyth, the uber myth, that talks about how all of us are required to take this journey to learn who we are, that we're, we're confronted with challenges, that we cross thresholds, we learn new things, we're mentored, we face temptations, and we go through true existential crisis. I'm tired of hearing about existential crisis in the news. I was once a philosophy major. I know what an existential crisis is, and this is different. It is figuring out who you are and who you need to be in relation to the work that's required of you in this world. You figure it out and you bring it back into the return. That is the first half of the hero's journey. And, and Joseph Campbell and I, Man and Myth with Bill Moyers, if you've never seen it, I encourage you to study the work of Joseph Campbell, one of the wisest voices out of the last century. But he always said that his journey was misunderstood, that the adventurous seeking and the return with the treasure is only the first half of the first half of the journey. The second half of the journey is what you do with that treasure, what you do with what you've learned, how you've taken that journey, and how you've converted it into useful thinking and sharing to make a better world. And I stand here before you saying that I'm still as committed as I ever was to take those skills and talents and everything that we have and everything we are, and to take on the world in some big ways, if for no other reason than to see what happens. So learning. Uh, it's funny, in 1990, I was here at an airport manager's conference, and the then airport manager from Reading gave a book report on Alvin Toffler's third book, which was called Power Shift. First one, Future Shock, shock second one, Third Wave, and then the Power Shift. All about the world that we were going to live into when the Future Shock, shock was written back in the 60s and projected the digital world in front of us. We had no idea, but boy, boy have we lived into that. But these words stand true. These words are what I live by, that we will be required to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And everything that I have done in the past 10 years has required that I completely relearn new sets of skills, let go of things I thought I knew that I really didn't, and learn my way into successful solutions. OK, wrong one. There we go. So, what happened at the airport manager, I was the airport manager in Salinas, after San Carlos, I did do a stint in Grass Valley, Nevada City, which for those who don't know, is in California. It's an hour northwest, northeast of Sacramento, old gold mining town. I moved there, ran the Grass Valley Airport for a couple years, which was uh, a very interesting experience. Uh, and then came to Salinas. Um, I was consulting to airports. I was consulting this airport when Mark Batista left, came over here to Monterey, and I took the job as the airport manager. So one of the things I've always done is I've been an organizational development consultant for much of my, much of my career and have always worked at trying to improve the way we work together. So what I did was I reorganized the public works department. The recession hit, excuse me there, the recession hit uh, things got bleak. People were trying to slice and dice the public works department. I said, give me a second here. I have experience in this. So I rebuilt the entire public works department. I worked with the staff, took 90 days, did it. And at the end, the city manager said, well, that's a great plan. I want you to run it. And I had not even considered running it. I was being a consultant. I was being objective. I was putting together an organization. I was working with my team. And he says, no, I really want you to take this. And I said, I can't give you that answer right now, which really freaked him out. He wanted me to say yes on the spot. I said, first, I better check with my wife, and which was really important. And, and secondly, I just worked with all the employees in this department to reorganize it. And if they thought for a minute that I did this to benefit myself, it would have worked. So I checked in with everybody, and their response was, please take it. 
So for seven years, I became the public works director for the city of Salinas, had the airport. Uh, I didn't have to worry about the airport. Uh, in that time, we built a police department. We built two libraries, which was my antidote to a new police department. Um, and then we did a, uh, a $25 million energy retrofit program, which included four megawatts of solar, 6,000 street lights, 10,000 internal lights. The apartment building down in the corner is ground zero in the homeless situation in the city of Salinas, where we built uh, 90 apartment units, uh, half of them zero income residency. Not enough, will never be enough. It's one of those problems that we, that we face that we need to deal with, that we are not really equipped to do that. Salinas is a tough place. I love that place, but man, is it tough. You know, we got gangs, we got, uh, we got high crime. We're 160,000 people during the agricultural season. We don't know how many people we have because we have immigrants, we have transients. Uh, we think it goes to 180, 190, but it is the largest city between, between Oxnard and San Jose. So a lot going on there, ground zero for the agricultural industry that, that Marianne spoke about. A lot of work there, but never enough resources. In a time where you're living through the recession, I became the public works director just as the recession was kicking off. Uh, I, one of my great lessons is that change will happen faster when you have money than if you don't. Uh, you can fund things, and so it was a struggle. I think it, I did change the entire department. It became a department of 145 employees, a $50 million budget, very high performing, made the most of what we had all the time, working and, and being creative, but still with not enough money, seven years. I miss the people, I don't miss that job. It was good and it was important and I made a lot of important con contributions process-wide, engaging the community, I had a great city manager, councils, you know, elected folks go up and down, you all know how that goes. Uh, but it, it was really important, I learned a lot and that's why I took it. But I found myself getting soft, so I decided I'd do water. So California flag, new California flag. 2011, 2017, what I did was I went from the Great Recession into the Great Drought. This is one of the deepest, longest droughts in the history of California. It did not rain pretty much in the Salinas Valley for five years, very little rain. It was all up and down the state. It was devastating. If it had gone another year, the crop losses would have been in the millions. There's a lot going on with water and, and how I got into water was that this was one of my assets as a public works director where I actually had these are our industrial waste site where we process water, but this water doesn't come from industrial processing as you would think about it. One of the great contributions to modern life as we know it from the city of Salinas is salad in bags. And I figured out how to take heads of lettuce out of the fields and the people that were picking that lettuce, put them in cooler rooms, wash the lettuce, chop it, put it in plastic bags, and increase the value of a head of lettuce anywhere from 15 to 25 times. That's been very lucrative. We were receiving about 2,500 acre feet a year of water. And you know, one of the things about getting into water, I could now speak to you in language that you would never understand the same way you speak about airports to other people and they don't understand you either. So the acronyms, the technical measurements, all the metrics and all that stuff in a whole new world to be learned. But what we did is we looked at this water and we realized that there were people out on the Monterey Peninsula and people were out promoting the idea that our water could be used for recycling, but no one ever talked to us. It was just some ways, this water's out there, we're gonna use it. So um, I intervened. And this is what I intervened into. So you got the 2.1 billion. Uh, I'll go with Mary Ann's numbers. The ag industry is really closer to 10 when you do all the rollovers and the calculations and how money moves. But we have the tourist industry over on the peninsula. We have over in the valley, the ag industry, and down in between the middle is the lettuce curtain. Lettuce curtains, if you're coming from Salinas, if you're going the other way, I've heard it's called the Cypress Curtain. But make no mistake, where you are now in the Salinas Valley are very different places. They are, the economies are different, the people are different. But at the same time, we're all facing issues around water. The Carmel Ru River that provides the majority of the water to the peninsula is under a cease and desist order with pumping being regulated because of habitat protection. The seaside aquifer, which is very near to us, 
and you are right here, uh, is overdrafted and has been adjudicated, which means the courts have decided how much water can be used out of that and who gets that water uh, has been adjudicated for years. Uh, is there enough water? In the middle, you will see a little blue box that says RTP, which stands for Regional Treatment Plant. Back in the 80s and 90s, we took all of our affluent, all of our sanitary waste, and sent it to the mothership. And I'm going to refer to that as the mothership because it has become the center for a lot of water in, in the peninsula. So um, they have been treating affluent to a tertiary level, a third level of treatment, which makes it useful for irrigation onto crops. It's the first area in the country that used uh, that water for crops. And it freaks a lot of people out, you know, to think about that. But when was the last time you were at Disneyland and the Orange County is processing 100 million gallons a day of sanitary sewer water into drinking water that you drink when you're in Orange County? It's good, it's safe, it works so far. It's good. Um, so that water is pumped up to the north end of the county uh, for irrigation, but this, uh, this plant has also gone into what's called advanced water treatment and is providing potable drinking water for the peninsula. So it's a really complex web and system, and I entered into that system bringing 2,500 acre feet of produce wash water that had never been used. When we look up in the North County, and I will say more about this, seawater intrusion is the single greatest threat to quality of life in Monterey County, in my opinion. I work on water, I'm biased, but nearly 200,000 people's drinking water is threatened by overdrafting that pulls water out of the ground so the ocean moves in. You can't drink seawater, you can't grow with seawater. It looks pretty, fish grow in it, but it is not where you want it. My guys figured out, loved my team, they figured out that if they took a bladder, put it into emergency overflow system, and connect, they could connect the sanitary sewer system with the industrial wastewater system, and overnight in the middle of the drought, we produced 2,500 acre feet of new water for recycling, and sent it north to help folks who were starting to suck water out of the, seawater out of the ground. We stepped up, we took charge of our own resources, we put a stake in the ground and said the city of Salinas is now a player in water, and we will forever be at the table. They taught me over on the east side of Salinas where life is tough that if you're not at the table, you could be on the menu. <laughs> so we weren't gonna be on the menu, we are gonna be at the table, and we are. And this seawater intrusion got so bad, but this is just one of the examples in the state of where this drought was having serious negative impact, where you had uh, the ground sinking in the Central Valley, uh, canals and bridges being broken with the collapse of land while the water was sucked out of it, uh, lack of water, crops dying, uh, bad salts coming to the surface. Across the state, we're having big problems driven by the drought. So the governor signed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act 2014-2015, went into effect and really what this says is we're going to, we're the next to the last state in California, I mean the next to the last state in the country to manage groundwater, and we're going to take it on. And like we like to do in California is we went straight to the head of the class for regulating it. We didn't, you know, I went to a national sustainable conference and they talked about a well field. My first basin is 84,000 acres that I need to bring into sustainability. So we were talking at scale and scope like no one had ever done, but there were some really important things that attracted me to this work. It said that the work will be done locally. We do not want to manage your water from the state level. We want you to manage it. Unless you can't, and then we'll come in and manage it for you and charge you a fortune. So one of the great drivers behind doing this work is if we don't do it, the state will. So we wanted to do it. That it would be transparent. That everybody would know what's going on that all beneficial users would be included. And in the Salinas Valley, that is everyone. We all use groundwater. So we need to put together a process that really included everyone. And finally, that it would be driven by science and data. Uh, so I decided I wanted to do this. I was getting soft, wanted to do something different, but I thought I learned some things about how people work together. We're taking on, I think, one of the big problems for our future. We're taking on a huge challenge, implementing a law that's never been done. No one knows how to do it. So I took the job. 
So this is my 18400 pressure aquifer. So we have five aquifers, all which require groundwater sustainability plans. This one is where the seawater intrusion was. It's identified as a critically overdrafted subbasin. We had two years to do the plan. Two years to reverse 40 years of, of, of poor management. Um, we also uh, formed an agency. We for did a funding mechanism, designed a governance model, and produced this plan. The deadline for this plan is four days from, from now, January 31st, 2020. Got it in on Friday or I wouldn't be standing here. It's been, it has been just a remarkable deadline to meet with everybody understanding that we had to get there and it's been quite a process and I'm gonna talk some about it. But I gotta tell you, no, I did not know what I was getting into, but I am glad I did this because of the opportunities it gave to me to understand how we can take the broad range of skills that we've learned over the course of our career and redirect those skills to some of the most pressing problems we have. And again, I've never been a part of a group that was more adept at using those skills creatively across a broad range. So this is what it was like, was I was the guy in the front and I like to, because I like to pretend I have hair. Actually, I like this slide because it's a bunch of old, angry, bald-headed white men, so I feel comfortable. <laughs> um, but, but, but really, um, this is what happens with everybody's got ideas. Everybody's thinking they know how it works. There's so much information I've been pumping for 30, 40 years. I know how it works here. Well, what if the science doesn't say that? So everybody's got an idea. Everybody thinks they know how it works. Everybody's after it, and you're out on point in this. So it takes a lot of work to put this together. This is how we did it. This is the first two years of the plan. This does not include the first three years of building organization. In two years, we did 128 public meetings, and I was at every one of them. Uh, a lot of them were governance models. I mean, we have a board, we've got subcommittees, we've got a finance, we've got an advisory committee. So our board has 11 members with, uh, we've got disadvantaged communities, we've got environmental groups, we've got ag folks, we've got agency folks, uh, small cities, big cities. Uh, our advisory committee is double that. We have 26 members on the advisory committee that represent the full spectrum of all of the users of groundwater. Uh, and that's where we hash it out. It's uh, my favorite group. I run those meetings. It's the deliberative engine. It's where, you know, you want a best practice for running your boards, shed blood at the committee level so it's cleaner when you get to your board. So work it out ahead of time, work with people, get your situation in place, have the real conversations and let your board decide. Had mixed results with that, but mostly it worked. But fortunately, because the state cared about us so much and they put out this new law that they also put out six volumes of best management practices to guide us. Well, this is really interesting because you know, my thinking of best practices prior to this are things that already exist, that other people are using, that you might wanna try in your organization, or you might wanna create a better way to do that. They wrote six volumes of best management practices for work that had never been done for a planning process that never existed. And they did not think it was funny when I suggested they should change the titles to, this is how we think you should do it practices instead of best management practices. I, I gotta give credit to these books. They lay out a great framework for having the conversations. You're working with something that no one's ever done before. It's extremely complex. These, these documents embody the vocabulary, the thinking, the, the context. So they're really good for creating uh, conversation and allowing you to work through it, but they are not the be all and end all for sure. So uh, I do wanna talk about best practices because as you're going forward through this conference, it's focused on best practices and, and, and Brent told me I had to do this anyway. I have to talk about best practices, but it's okay. And I think a lot about best practices, where they came from and how we use them. And generally it's a method or technique that generally, generally we think is a, a method or technique that we use that will give us the best result. Sometimes we make them up ourselves, sometimes we borrow them from other people, sometimes we see volumes of best practices published with a lot of people thinking about the best way to do something. That's what a best practice is. We break it down a little further, um, that best is that which is the most outstanding or desirable, and practice is the actual application. But there are a couple of problems when you break it down like this, because practice is also something you keep doing over and over until you get it right. Uh, which best practices are partly about, 
But best is also a very subjective term. You know, what is best for you? What is best for another airport? How does that work? How does that fit into your organization? And so what is really best? So when we start to look at best practices, I want to break it down and think about that and think about how it applies to you and how it works. A little bit of history first. It's the 23rd thousandth most used phrase in print these days. So a lot of talk about, about best practices. First surface in written literature, late 1700s. We were out settling the frontier. People were moving west building farms, setting up farms, raising animals, and the first best practices were around agriculture and animal husbandry so that we could survive as we moved west and began to conquer the land. There was also a period of time in there where we started implementing laws of the land. So there was a fair amount of best practice thinking done around trial courts and, and, and judges and that sort of thing. So that's the first time in the literature that we got it in you know, a couple centuries ago. The real change started happening post-World War I when Frederick Taylor uh, was one of the great efficiency experts. And I one time took the AAAE written test. I didn't pass it, but I took it. But that was one of the answers that I got right. And Frederick Taylor was in there, but he was an efficiency expert. He measured motion and time and, and studies and, and, and relocated things and put machinery in places where people could be more efficient. Basically, his job was to, to use you up, to get the most out of human production possible in organizations. But he started identifying best practices. And his work went on to influence uh, you know, production lines and, and how we did work. Uh, and that's where the modern conversations about best practices really started. But best practices as we know them really started appearing in the, in the 1990s. And uh, Xerox uh, started a benchmarking process about that time. And what's really different about what, what Xerox did is they started to look outside the organization. They started to look at benchmarking. They started to compare themselves to other organizations. And this was really working for them, all, for them, although I don't know how well it was working for them because this is when they famously decided, you know, we're not a computer company, we're a copier company. Even though at the Menlo Park Lab, they had the first graphical user interface and the first mouse, and they let Steve Jobs in there, and he walked around and looked at all that, and the first Mac came out with the GUI interface. And Xerox said, that's not what we do. We do copiers. Would have been a different world, but they benchmarked that somehow. But they began to look at other organizations and began to describe benchmarks, best ways of doing things. And the benchmarking was the result you got when you tried one thing over another. In through that period came excellence, excellence in customer service, which we've heard about today, the importance of customer service. Uh, we had the total quality management systems in there that started looking at, at best practices. And on and on till it's never end. And now we do things with best practices where we think that they, they've sort of become something that we decide are the best ways to do things to rules of the road, how we live. But I'm not sure that that's how we should be thinking about best practices. Of course I'm not. I'm sure that's not how we should be thinking about best practices. Uh, what is a best practice? Uh, it is a context for behavior in your organization. It's changing organizational learning and behavior. Encourages innovation. Manages collective knowledge and information. Supports regulatory compliance. Improves organization's performance and productivity. It can do all of those things provided you use it that way. If your best practices manual becomes like your rules and regulations manual or your HR manual or your, or your airport plan and sits on a shelf and isn't dynamic and part of your conversation every day and that you're all in agreement that the, what the best practices are and the best practices aren't static and that we have a number of outside influence that cause us to change all the time that may require us to revisit our best practices, then you can have all these things. But if it sits on a shelf, it will not transform your organization. It will, in fact, not do what a best practice is intended to do. And this is what we have to watch out for. I was really thrilled to do a Dilbert cartoon and presentation. I think I haven't done one in 10 years. But it used to be you couldn't go to this conference without Dilbert uh, having his, like, he should have registered. Uh, he was on so many slides. But really, this is what happens. If you take what everybody else has done, you know, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. So when you take a best practice from somebody else, what are you aspiring to? Is it for your own organization or you want to be like that organization? What problem are you trying to solve? Otherwise, there's a vast ocean of mediocrity in this world. And I wouldn't invite you into that. We're better than that. 
But this is where it really starts to come down to a best practice for me, is there is no one right answer. I was once sort of semi-famous in this organization for saying when you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport. Every airport is unique. Every one of us is unique. Our DNA is unique. Our fingerprints are unique. Our cities are unique. Every single thing is unique. Complexity theory, there is no two things in this world that are identical. It's useful to think that way. It's helpful to organize that way. We drop things in buckets and, and boxes and categorize and, and make meaning and sense. But the truth at the core is there is no single right answer. And our brain, and so in, I think it was 1994, I gave my first presentation to this conference, and it was on technology, and I talked about the brain as the ultimate technology. I am not as enamored as the, with the brain now as I was then, but I'm still, I still talk about it a lot. And so one of the reasons why we think there's a single right answer is the brain is constantly husbanding energy. A big part of your brain's job is to make you survive. But that brain was formed back when there were dinosaurs and our old brain. So our brain is constantly saving energy to protect us so when we come around the next corner and there's a saber-toothed tiger there that we can react without getting eaten. Whether that, that saber-toothed tiger still exists or not is beyond the point. Your brain still works that way. So the husband energy, it will give you polarity. It will give you two decisions. It's either white or it's black. It's either right or it's wrong. And every one of you who's got any miles on this road at all know that the answer is never that simple. But our brain tells us it is all the time, so it's going to tell you you got the right answer. When it's nuanced, when you take this and put it, we do not live in a binary world. The world is not one thing or another. And whether you're talking about all the people, all the diversity we live in, the, there is no single answer and nothing is binary. So how are we thinking about best practices in light of that. What, do, what does that mean? I want to talk some more about the brain, though, because, you know, so the brain is always not our best friend, and, but we can understand it. In fact, we've learned more in the last 15, 20 years about our brain than we ever knew. This is a really useful model. It comes from a guy named David Rock, Dr. David Rock, who wrote a book called um, Your Brain at Work. Uh, great TED Talk. If you want to find him, he's really good. does a much better job of it than I. All those uh, meetings that I had, I went into those meetings understanding what people want from each other when they work together. What is, where are we hardwired for? What do we want when we work with other people? Well, we want status. I want to be able to speak up in the meeting and not have to shut up because my boss is sitting there. I want my thoughts, my ideas, my opinions to be valued as an individual. Hierarchy gets in the way of that and prevents that. I'm not going to talk because somebody in the room's going to judge me for it or be my boss or it's going to show up on my performance evaluation. You've got to open the door on that and value all voices. Certainty. We all crave certainty. I'm telling you, if certainty is what you want, water is not where you want to be working. Uh, there's very little certainty. And in fact, there's very little certainty in anything that we do, but our, our brain keeps telling us there is because it needs to be comfortable. And to get to that certainty, it will take really complicated ideas uh, and it will freak the brain out when you drop a really complicated idea on it so it will treat it like a threat and it will begin to reduce that idea down until it's comfortable with it. It will make it simpler and simpler. It will reduce the complexity of the question that is asked until your brain is comfortable with it and then you'll answer the question with only half the information and wonder why it didn't work. So we have to guard for that, that, that certainty will drive us and we should say we don't know and we don't know and we can learn. Autonomy, I want to I want to express myself freely. I want to have control over my destiny. Relationships. And I, and I, I heard this from United, but I you know, see this. We, our job is to weave the web, is to constantly build the relationships, constantly connect data and information and people to make the best decisions possible. That's our job, and we have to focus on relationships, and the brain wants those relationships. We are community-driven. We are tribal-driven. We work in groups and clumps and organizations and everything else, and the brain wants those relationships to be safe. And then ultimately, fairness, and I've got to tell you, that in this world in which we live, and I identify so many of the issues, the questions about fairness, your brain wants fairness. You know, you will judge everything by your perception of whether it is fair or not. 
We do it all the time. Think about that one. Uh, try it out. You'll see that fairness, and when people do not believe something is fair, they will fight you to the death for it. So you've got to have this conversation, but it's not enough for me to know this. I actually give this slide to all of my groups. We create a common language around the neuroscience of working together, understanding that one person wants certainty, another wants autonomy, and we make this part of the dialogue so that we, we map out our desires and our thinking. Did that all through the water process. But those are still not enough. So I think about best practice and I think about where we want to go and what we want to do. So how about preventive maintenance for a best practice? Um, we got problems with infrastructure. And as a public works director, I mean, I did the infrastructure report card for the city of Salinas, $600 million before the below the line. Um, and that's okay because, you know, state of California is about 85 billion below the line. And I say below the line, that is the money it would take to just bring us up to standards. And in this country, we're something like $7 trillion below the line on infrastructure development. There's an old uh, Twilight Zone episode. I, I always, you know, more and more love the millennials, love everybody, all the entire arc of all the generations. But I find that I, I cons consistently make references now that have no meaning to, you guys know what uh, Twilight Zone is? <laughs> good, okay. That's good. Have to check. I used one recently, the third rail. I said, you don't want to do that. It's like touching the third rail. And everybody's like, what? Or I did one. I was like, well, you know, before the hippies were beatniks, and somebody says, what's a beatnik? I said, man, it'd be crabs, you know, but um, that's it. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it's an old, an old joke. So anyway, this episode of the Twilight Zone, uh, the monsters come to Maple Street, and they show this, this, this city with uh, the lights going on and off in neighborhoods. In this neighborhood, the power went off, and this one, it went back on, and this one had it. And they're looking around going, they got power over there. We don't have power. Why do they have power? And this whole community went to war about who was controlling their power, and the episode ended with two aliens in a flying saucer that said, look, we don't have to intervene in this. We just control their resources and cut them off, and they'll destroy themselves. Um, so I got a house in Nevada City, up in the gold country, went three times through power sh shutdowns this year, and the first one was like when the monsters come to Maple Street. When you couldn't buy batteries in the store, uh, lines of people at gas stations, you could tell where the power stopped uh, and started again because of the trucks at the gas stations getting gas to run their generators. It was a cluster. I'm telling you, people with, with medical equipment without power, and you know, PG&E sent me texts and called me up every day and said it was fine, they were working on it. Um, that was one of the amazing things to me. The other amazing thing was uh, even after they, they shut down the grid, there were still fires, and that wasn't amazing to me. What was amazing to me was the people that were shocked that there were still fires after that. You know? So uh, it's what are we gonna do about this infrastructure? What are we gonna do about a, one of the single greatest resources we face? It's broken. A friend of mine from Colorado called me up and said, why is your utility punishing you like that? Have you sued them too much? <laughs> so forest fires, I started my career with forest fires on a hot track crew in Southern California. Uh, uh, you know, it, it served me really well. I learned that uh, teamwork on forest fires, you get your teamwork down or somebody dies. And so you learn a lot. You learn a lot about facing down natural disaster. You learn a lot about intensity. Um, but the fact is, is that if I went to a fire that was 10,000 acres, that was huge. That was a big fire. I went to one that was one time 250,000 acres, but took 30 days to get there. Now we burn 10,000 acres in an afternoon and 250,000 acres in a week. Uh, one fire like that will wipe out a year's worth of carbon sequestration in the atmosphere. What are we gonna do about this forest management? It's about the urban wildland interface, about land use planning. Uh, but it, the temperatures are rising. The drought has stressed the fuels, and we're going to continue to see this. Anybody know what this means? Yeah. Yep, exactly. So Forbes magazine identifies this as one of the top five transportation issues in the next 10 years. So what are we going to do about this? You know, I one time sat at the, uh, at the air show at the city of Salinas, and and the uh, Blue Angels were arriving the next day, and I looked at him, I said, wow, have you ever thought about an air show with a carbon neutral footprint? 
Oh, man. Thought they were going to fall out of the church. I, I still like thinking about what that might look like. I have no idea what it might look like. Uh, but the fact is, is it there? This is a this is a subject that's going to not go away. Uh, how are we going to power these aircraft? How are we going to get there? Uh, I'm all for rapidly inventing the transporter from Star Trek, but um, save a lot of time. But this is something that this industry is going to have to face down and deal with, and it's very real. So I want to talk about what of the great lessons in resource management that I've learned. And this is, a, this is a logo for fisheries, and this is where the conversation starts because we've had common fisheries in this world for a very long time. Uh, nobody regulates how we fish in the ocean, or there has not been a lot of regulation. Some of the local regulations get closer to the coast, you get that. But the fact of the matter is, is a lot of places got fished out. Simply fished out, we may have destroyed species, don't know. Um, the, the fishing has become highly regulated, highly marketed, or there would not be fisheries. The Industrial Revolution gave us many amazing things, including the ability to harvest fish with machines in, in numbers that we had never seen before. We also see that in the agricultural industry, where we mechanized and created massive production of agricultural industry and created monocultures without knowing whether that's the best thing or not. So what we found in looking at this, a guy named Garrett Hardin, some of you know this, tragedy of the commons. So I find about 50-50, if you've taken a planning class, you'll learn about this. In the 60s, he studied uh, sheep farmers in, in Scotland and uh, determined that uh, when they grazed on common meadows, if they made decisions about their own needs and everybody made decisions about their own needs, they killed the meadows. They used up the resource. So tragedy of the commons is the understanding that if we are not regulated or marketed, that we, given a resource and left to making individual self-serving decisions, we will use up the resource. And that is tragedy of the commons. So when I looked at what I was trying to do with this planning and with Sigma and groundwater, what I realized is that the true conversation and the really revolutionary conversation is going from individual self-serving decision making to group and multi-beneficial user decisions. Group decisions from individual decisions that we would manage a resource collectively instead of individually. It's not socialism, it's not a lot of things. It's wisdom in trying to preserve what we have and accepting that as we grow, as we continue to evolve, we've created a capacity to use stuff up. So we need to think about that. So, Anybody know what the T stands for? Thank you. I, I thought that I thought we'd get a bigger on that. Um, but it's not about meetings. It's the same. It is about working with people. It is about talking to people. And uh, all these meetings were not these meetings. None of those meetings were those meetings. Our meetings were different. They were based on true partnership. And when I say true partnership, I don't need a partner that wants to show up because I got money that they want or I'm doing something they want to be a part of. I need a partner that brings themselves to the table, that is willing to sit down with me, say no, argue, work it out, have a conversation, figure out solutions. Now, if I ever was in a group of, of problem solvers, this is it. This is what we do. In fact, some of us want best practices so we can just keep our airports running because we have to spend all our time solving problems. So you systemize everything you can and then solve the problem. But that's what we're here to do. But true partners can help you working through that and discovery and learning together. The community engagement that we legitimately engage our communities in dynamic, dynamic conversations about their needs. You know, I learned this in the city. Uh, you might be, I might be an expert at paving your road, but you're an expert at living on that road. And maybe I should talk to you about what you think about my design. Revolutionary concept. You know, in government, we want to be the experts. We want to know, but do we really take into consideration our citizens, our customers, and their needs? How do we engage our communities? Really critical. Collaborative process. Right people, right resources, right topic, and by all means, the right process. And I am a process guy. This is about designing process where people can actually work together. They can have the tough conversation, that they can hammer it out. You know, one of my best practices for all those meetings was no yelling. 
you have to work with people, and we've got to work it out together. And how do you bring these groups together and build trust? And I'll talk about that more in a minute. But network governance is the one that I most found when I realized, looking at the tragedy of the commons, I realized managing this water, we are not at all organized to manage resources on a regional basis. We draw lines around water in the ground, acting like we know where it is. We really don't. We put political boundaries on water. Water does not recognize political boundaries. How do we have these conversations about the best use for these resources? So a uh, book called uh, Water is for Fighting for and Other Myths of the West talks about the Colorado River folks. You want to talk about water management, got seven states, hundreds of agencies. Uh, and what they have discovered is that they're doing their work through a network of individuals who meet, if we call it the network, figure out what needs to happen, and then go back to their individual agencies and organizations and codify the rules and regulations they need in order to make this work. What this essentially does is says, we have to stop giving our time and money to the attorneys and figure it out for ourselves. With water, I was on a phone call last week with six attorneys and myself around water. We have to get to voluntary decisions. We have to agree as a community. We have to agree as individuals what we need for ourselves and our community and figure it out. Give all your time and money. Wow. Okay. So, moving on. I uh, wanted to talk about uh, best practices here and implementing best practices. And this is really about uh, planning, learning, doing. We tell ourselves we're planning, that we're just going to plan it, we're going to put it in place, it's going to work. And the fact is, everything changes our plans all the time. The most important part of this is to evaluate. Take up somebody else's best practice, you put it to work at your airport, you should sure be paying attention to what happens when you do evaluate and adjust. That's your way through the uniqueness. Make it your own, but also I want to tell you that none of your plans work the way they think they do, and everything works like this, because once you do a plan, uh, outside influences immediately start changing your plan. You get new data, everything changes, so your plans need to be living and dynamic. So we may as well have the conversation and pretend that the reality is, is re like this, and not that we built a plan that'll work just fine. Another thing, learning to let go. Uh, Big part of what holds people back from having new thoughts is holding on to the past and letting go. We're with a guy named Bill Bridges who wrote a lot about transition in life. And he was, when you move from one thing to another, you really have to let go. And that mostly what we do is when we transition, we do it like monkey bars. And we hold on to the next bar before we get let go of the last bar. He says, you will never learn what's waiting for you. You will never understand what transition is until you climb up on the trapeze, take that bar in your hand, swing into space, let go and see what's waiting there to catch you. We've got to let go of the past. We've got to move forward. Power of narrative. Every one of these dots represents an experience in your life and your organization. Oop. And this is who you tell me you are. By telling me your history, you tell me part of your story. You're also that story. Those are all relevant, but I don't know those. I don't know those about you because you haven't told me. Or that's your story. And all of these are accurate, and it goes for your organization, and it goes for your communities. What is the story that you're telling about who you are? What is the story that you're telling? I'm telling you a new story today about the capacity you have and the knowledge that you have at your fingertips to create great change in this world by changing the story. Also, in your organization, you have a story about the competency of your organization, how good it is, how, how well it works. I hope your employees are telling the same story. I hope you have an agreed upon narrative that this is who we are. Because one of the most powerful things you have is deciding where we're going together. And all of these challenges I put forward to you need to happen. It's all about the hero's journey. It's all about the learning and discovery. I'm going to move through these quickly, running out of time. These are the ones I've been through with you a lot. Got to keep learning. My 93-year-old mother, who I just, just visited in the hinterlands of Arizona, uh, tells me that the key to long life is continued learning. She reads the National Geographic every month, continues to read a book. She's as sharp and mean as she ever was, and I love her dearly. <laughs> Be grateful, not hateful. One of the things that, that staggers me in this world is the level of hate. And I don't care where you are uh, politically, I don't care where you are ethnically, I don't care where you are gender-wise. Hate is hate. It diminishes you. It diminishes the other person. We've got to lose it. It's not going to get us where we need to go. 
Gratitude's good, man. A lot, of, a lot of benefits. I choose optimism every day. It's something I believe in. It'll help people sleep better. Who doesn't want that? Empathy and reduce. There's many, many benefits from being grateful. And I decided a long time ago that I was not going to be a negative, cynical person, although I was headed that way, that I would choose optimism every day. And I could be wrong, and I could miss the boat, but I'd be happier about it. Trust is everything. How I'm going to decide if I trust you is are you credible? Do your words have meaning? Do you say what you mean? Uh, reliability, are you going to do what you say you do? And self-orientation, is it about me? Am I doing this for me or am I doing this for us together? Intimacy, can I create a, sa a place that's safe enough for us to have these conversations? And for me, that big part of process uh, with, with hundreds of people is to create a place where people feel safe enough to share their deepest concern about the management of resources. Then, of course, there's service. The main thing here about service is that service, helping others, promotes positive development in teenagers. Now, who doesn't want that? Uh, but uh, service matters. We chose service, every one of us here, uh, serving our community, serving our people. My challenge to you is to do more. So take these skills that you have because it's all about choice. Viktor Frankl, with the great minds of the last century, he learned this in concentration camps. He learned that those who serve survived. Those who were served did not. He also says your life doesn't make sense while you're living it. It's only in hindsight that it makes sense. And I gotta tell you that having a few more miles on the road, he's right. Uh, some of the stuff I did now makes sense. Uh, some of the stuff I did makes no more sense then than it does now. But it's still, it's about our choices and it's about our responses. And as we look at the world and what's challenging us and what's changing us, what are we going to do about that? You know, I love this movie, The Martian. He's going to science the bleep out of stuff, which we need to do, but also in the last scene where he's at the academy, they asked him how he did it. And they said that, you know, you solve one problem, you solve the next problem, you solve the next problem. Then you live or die. But we're facing problems that need to be solved. We're facing problems that need to be addressed. We're facing conversations we've never had. And I want to tell you about planning, one more thing about planning. It used to be a plan was, this is what happened in the last 20 years, so we think it's going to happen in the next five years. I asked a computer modeler about how he maps uncertainty on water use. Uh, 20 minutes later, I didn't know what he said, but it was scary. So we have no way of predicting the future. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to be the guy standing there saying I didn't do anything. What I really like about this guy is he freaking landed a rocket. You know, I've been a science fiction guy my whole life, but when those rockets came down and landed on the pad, you know, for the first time in my life, I saw the science fiction future that I knew existed. But it's really true. Here's a guy, it's about profit. It's about changing the world. It's about making things different. But, you know, we've got a challenge ahead of us. It's generational. It's long term. Um, the future's at risk. What are we going to do about it? Uh, anybody know what this is? Thank you. It is the Polis Water Temple. It's the terminus of the Hetch Hetchy water system that was built in the 1930s to run water gravity flow from next to uh, Yosemite and a valley next to Yosemite uh, into uh, San Francisco to provide water and power. At the end of it, they built four water temples, and this is one of them, and I love this picture. My wife loves this picture because she swims and she wants to swim in that pool, and they won't let her. But you know, they, when they did this, they weren't taking it for granted that there was an amazing engineering feat here. They weren't taking it for granted that they took a resource and moved it around. They freaking built temples and monuments to the importance of the work that they did. And I really want that. I really want us to take the time to understand what it is we're doing, to take it seriously uh, and be responsible. And when you're thinking about building monuments and that you did it right, that's a good way to go. Uh, I'm going to wrap up here with, because this is what's on the line. Uh, we have moved beyond uh, simply existing as in my lifetime. Uh, I remember uh, telling a story of, as a kid sitting uh, at the dinner table watching the Vietnam War, which is what we did at the dinner table in the 60s, and I was watching film that was uh, filmed two weeks before, and they processed it and flown it back and put it on TV, and we're looking at these film strips. How long does it take now? You know, you, you're there. It's, it has all changed and we live in a global environment. The walls are breaking down, the problems are real. What do you want for your future? I really think, and this is what I want from you, I really want you to think about what else you can bring to the party, to take these skills that you've learned and think about these issues that are facing us and where you want to come down on this. Thank you.
question. We have about two minutes, minutes for questions. <laughs> Good. Mr. Sabo. Thanks, Gary. Uh, it's right there. Right there. Uh, thanks, Gary. Uh, in terms of process, and uh, with your big process guy, when it comes to decision making, talk to me about majority rule versus this watered down consensus business, okay? I understand consensus is the way everybody does it, but uh, majority rule, uh, how do you make a decision? Well, uh, so given the way you biasly phrased that question, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I uh, do believe in consensus, and the way we did it in this process was a lot of the consensus was developed in the less formal advisory committee level where we really hashed out the ideas and formulated the ideas, but given the nature of, of, of designing a process that exists within a legal government structure, it would then come to the board to make the final decision. And it went both ways on that because the process was really good at the deliberation level, but at some point the board felt like they hadn't had enough say around policy, and it's something that we're working on. But it's, it's a multi-tiered process, but I think consensus is a good way to work. Uh, if generally you've got a room that thinks it's the right idea, uh, the way to validate that consensus is to check with the people that don't agree with that and, and see if you can craft something that, that's more uh, in line with, with the general room. Uh, much, much consensus building, it's, it's a challenge and it does require process and a lot of technique. Thank you. But it, it, it matters, that's all right. I expect that from you, Jeff. <laughs> Hi, Gary. Gary Curcio, Monterey Airport Board. Uh, this is a bit off topic, but it actually is not. You brought us in, in your expertise right now in your position with water, et cetera. Uh, we have a master plan that we're trying to move forward. And to make that happen, we're going to have to have a long-term sustainable water source. And I'm, I'm just curious, because you're so closely connected to agriculture, that is it accurate that the ag agricultural community has is pretty much clear that there really is not any more additional source water uh, for phase two of Monterey One, and thus, if this is the case, do we not do we not absolutely have to have a successful desal project? So I'm not going to answer that <laughs> um, because I do work in water and I and I. Uh, uh, it's a, you, he just asked the most, one of the most topical, uh, extreme questions in water at this point. I do think we need new water sources. I think ultimately desal will be required, but I also think that there are other sources of water. So I think the answer is yes to both. Um, and I think we need every drop, and I think we need to look at every opportunity uh, to maximize all of it. Uh, you know, the question really, I think, as it comes down to it, is how much growth do people want? And as where you come down on growth is to where you come down on water. But I think we need all solutions. I think we need to entertain everything and do the best we can to solve these water problems. I hope that helps. Gary, welcome back to the tribe. We've missed you. Thank you, Mr. Um, I, I just, I don't have a question, but I just comment that, you know, for many years I've really looked upon you as the sort of our spiritual guide, Ooh. and uh, the, I know it's sick, it's sickness. Uh, <laughs> and and the, the sort of that, that. I like it, I don't know. Yeah, that softer heart part of our organization mm. compared to all the black and white people that, you know, too many of us are. But welcome back, and thanks for continuing to keep us thinking about the right things. Thank you, Joe. It's great to see all, everyone. It looks like we're good. All right. And I did get to oh. pick my own Beatles song. Oh, we got another one? Here? One more. Good song. Oh. <laughs> got to take this one. So, Gary, uh, you've spent a, a lot of years in organizational development and actually helping uh, uh, employers kind of manage the produ productivity of their teams. You have since now graduated into taking disparate groups and creating organizations around them. What is the glue that keeps them together? Is it just the gravity of the problem? Or are there other things where you're creating uh, functionality and loyalty within the, within the organizations that you're managing? Wow, big question. I could go on. I could give you a whole presentation on that. But I, what I would say is that trust is key. Um, that as the person who convenes the process and helps manage the process, that I have to be trustworthy. 
and that I don't have the answers. This is co-creation, this is collective learning, this is discovering the answers together. So it's equalizing the expertise so every voice has value, but it's also focused on the purpose of what are we here to do and people, keeping people focused. It's about the water and, and people, keeping people focused on that. It's not about your personal issues, it's about how we collectively manage it. So it's, it's a, a variety of tools and techniques about keeping people focused, but it's also about the charter from the beginning of what we're here to do and how we're here to do it. Our process started from day one with a facilitator on board. Is that me? Oh, that's me. <laughs> All right, it's like, who's doing that? But it, it requires, and we started, stop. We started from the beginning in a collaborative process. So everybody had ownership from day one on the organization that got built, the funding mechanism, the governance. You're just seeing the conversations around the governance because really who gets power? But every one of those facilitated, every one of those collectively held was whoever needed to have them. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. I'll see you in a minute. So we're going on a break uh, with exhibitors. Uh, it'll be over in the Carmel room. And Gladys has some announcements that she'd like to make. Uh, so just so everybody knows, one, those who are new, Again, it is a random raffle, so you put your card in here. It doesn't matter how many times you bend it, whether or not it rises to the top. I don't pick the cards. Somebody else does. Um, with that said, we've got lots of great raffles. You do have to be present to win. I won't be on this mic. There'll be a mic just for the exhibitor hall. So um, I usually draw within 10, 15 minutes prior to the break ending so you can spend time socializing, grabbing something to snack on and just kind of mixing and mingling. So we want to encourage you to, to do that. Uh, we also, of course, uh, do some fun discussions and talks. And then if there's anything that you need, let us know and enjoy the conference. So you can't miss me. Of course, again, blue dress here, six foot three in heels. So please find me. All right, sounds good. See you guys in there. <laughs>